Thank you for joining us today. My name is Jessica Reynolds. I'm the director of the Office of Downtown Development at the Georgia Department of Community Affairs. And I'm so glad to be with you guys on this rainy Tuesday morning. Um, but what we have for you today is a little bit different than normal. So traditionally, um, we do deeper dives in webinars and our, our topics can run a little long sometimes, sometimes 30 minutes, sometimes 40 minutes, sometimes an hour. Um, but today I just wanted to focus on one of the um, programs that is most commonly used for our our Main Street programs here at DCA. So this is this is a DCA offering um, that really ends up touching a lot of our downtown development communities across the state and is a really great uh, resource. My counterpart here at DCA, Cherie Bennett, who oversees this program, the DDR Left program or the Downtown Development Revolving Loan Fund, will be here shortly. Um, she is stuck in traffic right now, but she told me she's expected uh, to show up here around 1010. And so I told her, no problem, we'd get started. We're flexible, we're mainstream managers, we know how this works, um, life happens and you just deal with it. Um, so she'll be joining us shortly um, and be able to, to, to pipe in and um, help you know, answer questions and stuff like that as we get going. But you guys know I can handle the basics. Um, I can definitely talk about this program. I'm sure we will be able to get into the details and the weeds of all those questions we have. So let's just kick it off and get started. And one of the things I wanna um, kind of hit on today is that I'm not gonna be showing a lot of example projects of how this has worked in other cities. What I'm really focusing on today is the basics of understanding this program as well as understanding why you would want to use this program. So I feel like um, a lot of times when we hear people talk about the DDRLF, it's, you know, oh, it's this project here and that project there. Um, and I will say that I am just as guilty of this as anybody else, that when I was a manager, I knew it was a good program to use, but I didn't exactly understand why it was a good program to use. And it wasn't until I went through uh, the National Development Council's EDFP program, which stands for Economic Development Finance Professional, until I went through um, their like intensive courses of training that I really understood why somebody would want to use um, this tool um, as, a, as a resource. So my goal, you know, today is to help you guys understand why this is such a great resource out there for us to use and to take advantage of and hopefully help you explain it a little bit better when you're out working with your businesses. So it's all about being able to walk the walk and talk the talk. Okay. And if I can get my screen to cooperate, there we go. Um, so one of the things I want to highlight before we dive in is that um, while DDRLF, um, again, Downtown Development Revolving Loan Fund is a great tool in the toolbox, it's not um, the silver bullet. None of these things are. You'll see up here several different examples. I've got the DDRLF, I've got BID, which stands for Business Improvement Districts. You'll see facade grants up there, rural zone designations, which is, um, you know, tax credits that are available on, on different different levels and then even an example of something called a boost program which was developed by Milledgeville Main Street um, but you know I think the important thing to take away from anything that you learn or hear about whether it's from our office or other offices or other programs or other agencies or other organizations is that there is no one-size-fits-all solution for downtown development and revitalization that really you know the best bet we can do is to understand the tools and the resources that we have to work with and to layer them together so um, you know we're just going to be focusing on one of many tools that are in the toolbox and to my left I have Sheree Bennett who just walked in and is joining us. Hello. <laughs> we just like got started. Okay, good. Sorry, like, <laughs> I told him, you know how Atlanta traffic is, especially Woo. when you have a little bit of water. Yeah. <laughs> um, so we're talking about how this isn't just, you know, the silver bullet. This is one piece of a bigger puzzle for exactly. downtown development. Um, so we're going to dive, you know, just into the specifics of this program. Um, and one of the things I want to, you know, always highlight is how this whole thing fits into the bigger picture. So um, it really has that traditional 50-40-10 split with um, DDRLF coming in at that 40%. So, uh, you know, sometimes you'll hear these referred to as 504 loans, um, you know, like if you're working with SBDC or something like that. Um, but, you know, the idea is that 50% of this project will be financed by traditional bank financing. 
40% is where that gap financing idea comes in. Like we are helping to close the gap to make this project work. And um, I will talk about the terms in a little bit. And then 10% is going to be your owner equity. And that's where your you know, skin is in the game, where you are invested in this project and you're, you're helping to make this happen. So um, this is where like the, that whole puzzle comes together. We're going to understand the makeup. So with this project, um, that 40% is going to be 40% of the total project cost up to $250,000. Um, so you're going to max out at $250,000 um, if you are doing a million dollar project, you know, you're going to, you're going to hit that 250 cap. Now, if you are doing smaller projects and 40% is less than $250,000, that means the amount of the pie that you're going to get is going to be equal to that 40% or less. So, um, you know, for example, if you had a $200,000 project, you're not going to get $250,000 from us. You know, you're going to get that 40% relative to that $200,000. Um, one of the things I like to always hit on is that this is a non-recourse loan. And I think that's really important for communities that have never done one before, because there's always a lot of questions that kind of, you know, hang around who's going to be the one left holding the bag if everything goes bad. And if you've never done one before, I can see why that would be super intimidating, um, especially, um, you know, for a development authority or the city itself. So the idea is that the application uh, from the business is made, you know, that the development authority makes that application on behalf of the business. Um, so, you know, initially that applicant would be the development authority or in some situations it could even be the city. Correct, Sheree? That's right. Okay. That's right. Um, but the idea is that once the loan is given, those funds would go to the city or to the DDA and then be passed on to that, you know, originally that person you're working with in the application, that individual business, but then they pay the state back. And all this convolutedness is because of the state's gratuity clause. Um, so the idea is with the state gratuity clause is that no individual should benefit or receive funds that would individually benefit an individual business or an entity from the state um, or you know, on the local government level, it kind of works the same way. Right. We we've, we've had we've had communities that have been a little hesitant to do this because they think that they will be on the hook. But mm -hmm. please know that it is a non-recourse loan to the DDA. So at the closing of this loan, DCA basically makes a loan to the DDA, and at the same time, the DDA makes the loan to the borrower. At that point, really, the DDA is out. They're mm -hmm. just the conduit through which these state funds flow to the individual business. The DDA is out of it at, pretty much at closing, and then, like you said, the loan is going to mm -hmm. be paid back um, from the individual business to DCA. Payments aren't made to the DDA, they're made directly to DCA. So nobody has to worry like, oh, I need to track down this person to make sure they're making their payments or anything like that. Right. That once, you, once you've once you signed those papers and everything's final, you guys get to take that step back and you don't have to worry about all the details after that. You can just focus on bringing good projects forward. Exactly. <laughs> Bring us some more projects for your community. So again, you know, the idea is that like we're not hunting down the DDA or the city if this project doesn't get paid that individual business owner is going to be on the hook exactly we have often used the DDA you know if if we see that um, the business is not paying like they should we'll contact the DDA and say hey guys what's going on yeah because y'all you know you have your pulse on what's going on in downtown your finger on the pulse you'll know what's going on if if the business is not doing well or if perhaps there's been a death in the family, mm -hmm. something like that, you can let us know what's going on, but that would be the only time y'all. Yeah. <laughs> We're not going to come hunt you down for a check. No. <laughs> and then um, another important detail is that Main Street cities get a special interest rate. So if you are an accredited Main Street program, that means you're at that classic Main Street level or the GEMS level, you get special 2% interest rate. So you, uh, like you have to pay less money back, right? That's right. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> other, other cities um, are charged a 3% interest rate, but Main Street cities in good standing get the 2% interest rate. Awesome. And, you know, when we're talking hundreds of thousands of dollars, you know, that that, really I was going to say that can really, really add up. Yeah. So that does make a difference. Um, so, you know, again, I wanted to emphasize today, like, why would we use this program? And we'll talk a little bit later, later about like how we would go through it and what your first steps would be. But, um, you know, again, why would this 
program be something that people would want to take advantage of. So I'm going to show you in the next slide an example of like a case by case scenario of one using this project and one not using um, DBRLF. And so you can see it in the numbers. But again, we're just so you understand what we're trying to do here. Um, if you were to use this gap financing um, that is out there, again, the owner would have less equity that they need to invest in the project. So the idea is that they would have more capital to invest in their own business to get it up and running versus having money tied up in, you know, the the renovation and rehab of those projects um, because that's what DDRLF money goes towards. So it's not working capital. The idea is that these funds can be used to acquire a property and to redevelop a property or to, sure. to, to update it to what you would need to, you know, make it work for you. Again, um, using a DDRLF program um, or something similar, a program similar to this would uh, oh, lower the overall debt service. And what I mean by debt service is that's the money that we owe the bank. So the money we have to pay back on the outstanding debt, that's what debt service is. Um, it would also lessen the amount of traditional bank financing. So, you know, by having, um, you know, that gap financing, instead of asking for one big loan, we're almost, we're really, in essence, getting two smaller loans. Mm -hmm. um, and then also increasing your debt coverage ratio. And I'll go into that in just a, a second, because I think it's one of those things that when I can show you it, it makes a little bit more sense. Now, do you want me to talk about here about um, about gap, gap financing and what we're looking for communities to do before they apply, or do you want me to speak on that a little bit later? Let's save that um, for, for the end when steps. we start talking about going through the steps okay. and kind of like being a competitive project. Okay. So here I'm just gonna show them the numbers of okay. like what's working. Okay, so gap financing by the numbers. So the uh, deal you see before you, that's just a traditional like bank financing. The banks come in in an 80% um, perspective. Owner would have to make up that difference. Um, that's their equity that they would have to put in the project. And then you can see the bottom Line, total project cost would be about $315,000. Again, this is a made-up project. I'm just using these numbers to be able to illustrate the difference. And then if we came in with the DDR left project, the one that just popped up on the screen, you would see um, the bank coming in at 50%. Again, that number reduces how much their loan is going to be from $252,000 to $157,000. If that um, DDRLF is coming from a Main Street community, that gap financing could come in at that 2% interest rate, which would uh, max us out at $126,000 for this specific project with 10% owner equity at $31,500. So basically, not only are you lowering how much you're borrowing from the traditional bank, but you're also cutting your owner equity in about half. Numbers at the bottom still stay the same. You're still working with the same project. And again, I want to show you uh, another example of how these numbers don't, you know, don't lie. So when we're looking at a project's overall, so uh, NOI stands for net operating income. Again, this is a made up project. So some of these numbers are, are made up. Um, but if you have you know, debt service on the loan, again, that's how much you would be paying back annually in debt. So for the traditional bank financing, you would be paying as that individual $37,000 back every single year uh, in, in debt service on that traditional bank financing. Um, you know, depending on the project for this example, um, you know, you have your owner equity on the left, 63,000, that's how much cash the owner has to put into it. And with this project, there's not enough money coming in um, to, to offset the money coming out. So that means we're negative cash flow um, and our debt coverage, that DCR that you see there at the end, debt coverage ratio is important to a bank because what it's going to show is how much money you have to repay the debt. So for every dollar of debt that you have, they want to see 1.25, which means that I have a dollar and 25 cents to pay back every dollar of debt that I have. Um, so here you can see we don't even have enough to cover every dollar of debt that we have. And then again, our cash on cash rate of return is we're in the negatives here, meaning like we're not making money on our money. So again, the same numbers on the right hand side, this would be using the DDRLF or the gap financing. You can see our annual NOI, net operating income, how much money we're bringing in on that project. That stays the same. Nothing's changing with that. We're still working with the same numbers coming in. But our debt service on our first loan, again, went down from 37000 to 18000 So that's reduced a lot. Debt service on loan two, that would be our gap financing. That would be about 9700 Total debt service overall on both those loans is still ten grand less 
than what the traditional bank financing would be. This definitely helps with our cash flow. Cash flow increases. Owner equity, that means less money that the owner is having to put into that project, about half of what it was before. And then our debt coverage uh, ratio, which you see is now 1.3. So we went from not having enough money to, you know, to cover our debt to having enough and then some and over what a bank would typically want or expect. And then 26% rate of return, meaning for, you know, we're getting money back on our money. And that's what people want to see. You know, obviously when you're working with investors and stuff, it's I'm putting money in, how quickly can I get money out? Um, how quickly can I start making money with a project? You know, um, so all these things matter. You know, again, I it's always one of those like, well, if I can do it, why, you know, why would I want to go through that process? But the idea is that these funds are only going to be able to be used on specific things, but that frees you up with your owner equity to invest in your business and put in working capital and things that make sense for you. Um, so again, just want to be able to show you a side-by-side -side comparison of a project and why it would work with DDF versus you know traditional bank financing. Again, this is just a made up example, but based off of real life stuff. And, and again, this, this stuff does make a difference. Um, so, uh, you know, this is where we talk about, okay, now we understand why this is important. Like, where do we go? Where do we start? What's the next step? And um, I think it's always important here to, to rope in our regional reps. Um, Definitely. Our, our DCA regional reps, they're out there. We have one for every region of the state and um, they are really in situations like this gonna be our first line of defense. Um, they've done projects like this in other cities. Um, you know, I, I would say like they're, they're that person you want to kind of bless it before moving on to anything else. Like mm -hmm. if you have a project that you think may be viable, that's the person to contact. Right. And not just Sheree and be like, hey, Sheree, <laughs> by the way, how are you feeling today about this project? <laughs> of course, you can always call me, but um, it's great to go ahead and call your regional rep. They're close by. They can come and um, walk you and your business through the, the application. And they're actually required to do an IPA site visit, an initial project assessment site visit. Um, that has to be turned in, they turn it in, and that will come in sort of in tandem with you submitting your IPA, um, and that's the initial project assessment, which is basically a pre-application, mm -hmm. fancy word for pre-application. Mm -hmm. So um, so we say contact your regional rep, really they are required to do that site visit. They're there, like Jessica said, they've been through many, many, many applications. Um, they're able to give really good advice. Um, we talk often, I talk often with the regional reps to tell them, you know, what's going on and um, they really understand the program so they can help you out. Yeah. And again, and we'll hit on this in a minute, but you know, every project has to be competitive, you know, and I think that's where their expertise comes in as well to help make sure that you're not just wasting your time, energy, and resources on a project that may not be a viable one. So they want to make sure that, you know, when we're submitting something, we, we're we hoping that we're going to stand the best chance of being the most competitive in that, in that whole process. Um, again, you know, I think, you know, having the regional rep come in, you know, Cherie's telling you they have to do something anyways. Um, so that's important in helping, you know, and I would say even if you're not ready to necessarily pull the trigger at that moment, you know, knowing where you kind of stand or what you need to do ahead of time is always like kind of a good step yes, anyways. Um, but making sure your DDA and city are on board, you know, because again, the application itself is going to have to come from the DDA or city. So this is not something you want to get everybody all revved up about and excited to do and move on and then have you know, it'd be halted at the city level or the, the development authority level. And that's why it's important to help them understand these processes and procedures and what this expectation is and what this program is before you want to use it. So that way, once you have a viable project, everybody can just kind of move a little bit faster pace. Right. And if you think there's going to be any issue with the DDA, I would invite them to that initial meeting with the, yeah. with the regional rep um, so that the regional rep could calm any of their fears um, at that point. And answer any kind of those unknowing questions right. and stuff right. like that. Um, again, you know, if if everybody kind of gives it the green light, if everybody's in support of the project, if you know the regional rep gives you the green light, that's when we have them do that initial project assessment, which we call the that IPA. 
um, and that comes to you, Sheree, correct? Yes. And that would be um, on behalf of the, the development authority or the city would submit it to you on behalf of that individual business. Right. Mm -hmm. right. Now, what would you say to people who are like, well, they're not going to want to give me all their financial records and stuff like that. That's understandable. We've had that come up before. Um, we do ask for financial information um, that people might want to keep confidential so that the individual business could send that directly to DCA mm -hmm. rather than submitting it to the Main Street Manager yeah. to put together in the application. Okay. They're welcome to submit it directly to us. Okay. Cool. So it's not like that's the first time that's ever right, <laughs> come up right. before. But, but question, yeah. yeah. Um, so then all this stuff comes to you um, and the DCA either approves it you to move forward with the full application or would send it back and say, this is why we're we're stopping you at this point. That's exactly right. Okay. So um, it may be something like the location is not um, within the historic boundaries of the downtown. So location wise, it's ineligible. Um, maybe they were they were actually able to get full financing from the bank, so mm -hmm. that might cause them to be ineligible. But usually at the IPA stage, most people are deemed eligible. Um, and then in that IPA response letter, mm -hmm. that's what we send out, inviting them to submit a full application. We also list all the items that weren't included in the IPA that, that you we would, would need. expect to be included in the mm -hmm. full application. Okay. Um, and then we'll, we'll walk through the final steps, but we'll talk a little bit more about like what makes it project competitive in a second. So um, they would either say, you know, do the full application or not. If they get the green light to do the full application, um, the business would provide the rest of the details and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. um, it then comes to you and either gets, again, approved, turned down, um, you know, and then the project is completed and then the funds are awarded. That's key, right? Yes, yes. That's, right? that's a really important thing to know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I've had a lot of DEAs and Main Street managers say, "Wait, now what? Wait, we don't get the we don't get the funds until after the project is complete. Well, what are we supposed to do to get through um, with the project?" That's right. We do not close until the renovation project is complete because remember, we've based our award amount on 40% of total project costs. costs. So we have to actually see the project through to finish mm -hmm. and to know what the total project costs are yeah. to know that we are in fact giving 40% of total project costs yeah. because people may have, have inflated their budget. Yeah, you know, absolutely. Mistakenly. So we wait until um, the project's done and a certificate certificate of occupancy is issued um, before we close. So in the meantime, what is the what is the business to do? Yeah. They need to get interim financing from the bank. Like a construction, a construction loan. loan. Mm -hmm. yeah. So basically then you could use, once the project has been completed, you signed off it, you could use that money that you get from DCA to pay off okay. your construction loan. That's exactly right. Perfect. Mm -hmm. Okay. That makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Um, Okay, so let's talk about like what makes a project competitive and like what would automatically kick them out or something like that. Um, you know, you said it needs to be within the downtown district. Right, right. How do we define that? Or I know that's, you know, <laughs> I know that's not really definable, but I also know we're probably looking at something, right? Right. And I would say that's also another really good reason for the DCA regional rep mm -hmm. to do the site visit. Yeah. Because we want to make sure that it's within our, our regs say core historic commercial area and in the past we have and i think uh the georgia cities foundation uses the dda boundaries as um as their guide but we have found that in some communities the dda boundaries are the entire city oh yeah so we are having to look more closely at that defined area of core historic commercial, mm -hmm. um, not necessarily the gateways coming in, yeah. but that core historic area. Yeah. So we're really, when you look at an aerial, it's very, mm -hmm. it's very easy to see Cause you're going to see that density. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 Right. Because, you know, this program was designed to help downtowns, you know, so the idea behind it is you want to make sure that those dollars are getting invested mm -hmm. in the right way, in the right place. That's right. You know, they were not too liberal with the word downtown. So that way, we're, you know, spending money in places that won't necessarily benefit, you That's know. That's right. That's right. Because we don't want to invest money somewhere. One of, one of the things that we're looking at when we review the application is how is how is this um, 
rehab of the building and maybe a new business coming into this building going to affect, say, foot traffic for the rest of the downtown? How is it, um, its economic development going to affect the other businesses around it? Because what we'd love to see is, is this project be a catalyst for other things in your downtown. Um, if it's a half of a mile out of your downtown, it's not going to have much impact mm -hmm. on foot traffic in your downtown yeah. area. That makes so, sense. So those are the kind of things we're looking for. Um, talk a little bit about like, like credit worthiness and competitiveness versus like traditional bank financing and how all that like shakes out. Right. So once you submit the full application, um, I review it for completeness and of course review it to, ha to have everything that I need to do my review. But then it also um, goes to our credit team for credit underwriting. So it goes through the underwriting process just like it would at a bank. Um, I've had a couple of Main Street managers be upset that they had submitted several applications and they were denied. And what I've tried to tell that Main Street manager is, it is not your fault. You did everything right. The business, the mm -hmm. individuals were just not credit worthy and that you, you couldn't proceed yeah. at all. So it's totally not the, the Main Street manager's fault. It's just that they were not credit worthy. So I think DCA would take a little bit more risk than a regular bank, mm -hmm. um, but we still cannot take a total risk because we are a revolving loan program. If the loans do not get repaid, <laughs> yeah, we you, don't have any money if, to revolve. If money don't come back, that but, means more people don't get it. Right, 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 right. Um, so I would say as far as competitiveness goes, um, we need every project to go to the bank first. We are not here to take um, business away from the local bank. So we want them to go to the bank first. If the bank is unwilling to loan them the full amount because they're um, a brand new business, you know, mm -hmm. they're a startup business, then that's where we can step in with, mm -hmm. with the gap financing yeah. and help out. Um, I would say that if, if it's evident that um, you've gone to a bank or the business has gone to a bank and the bank is willing to loan them 80, 90% mm -hmm. of the total project costs, and yet you still apply. Um, because at this time, we are running a little bit short on funds. Mm -hmm. We probably have more applications in-house right now than we have money to give out. That doesn't mean we're stopping taking applications, so y'all still please apply. But um, I think that that would not be a very competitive project mm -hmm. if they're already able to get the money yeah. from a local bank. And I and we have seen some cities, um, city of Tifton comes to mind um, with Synovus Bank down there that has kind of really... Um, they proposed and structured their own version almost of a DDRLF that had to be, you know, funds had to be invested, but their cap was like 300000 mm -hmm. so a little bit higher rate, still same low interest rate had to be, you know, for da downtown um, development, you know, property um, acquisition and renovation. So very, you know, I think the thing is like what we're doing is also very trendy and popular, and I've seen other cities try and replicate this on a local level to, to make these projects happen, which mm -hmm. I think is pretty pretty cool yeah. all on its own yeah and we also so there's a sister program like this we've talked about the Georgia Cities Foundation and that's managed over at the Georgia Municipal Association and so um, you know again they have a little bit different guidelines and restrictions but we at DCA do all their underwriting correct right. so um, similar process very similar process on um, it, it you can't submit one application for both. Um, the financial materials. <laughs> they would can, love that, right? <laughs> yeah, the financial materials can be used for both since the underwriting um, is, is done here at DCA. Um, whereas we provide a 2% interest rate for Main Street communities, they're 3% across okay. the board. And they also charge some closing fees um, that we do not charge. Mm -hmm. So just keep that in mind, but they, they definitely are our sister program in larger, um, larger projects, maybe, you know, $1.5, $2 million project. Um, there are a lot of businesses that have come in and gotten 250,000 from us, mm -hmm. $250,000. Again, from that idea of like layering. Yes. Yes. Okay. Um, is there a population cap on who can apply for this? Right. It's uh, communities 100,000 and less. Okay. And, you know, another thing, when we were talking about competitiveness, I thought yeah. about, I, I was thinking about another application or a potential application that um, I was discussing with one of the regional reps. And we, we sort of batted it around 
but here here's the gist of what the project was it was basically a woman that had a little bit of extra money that she had inherited and was thinking about purchasing a building in downtown didn't have any plans for it wasn't going to do any renovations so there really wasn't a plan for job creation mm -hmm. or or making the building look better or even an idea for what business might be brought in mm -hmm. and um, was only going to apply for money for the acquisition and we really felt again at this time when we don't have um, that much money to give out that, that really wouldn't be a competitive application because yeah. you want to see jobs created exactly. you want to see something come of that yes. building we don't want it to just sit there right right yeah so um the most competitive projects i think what we would want to see is those that have job creation aspect to it um renovation i mean turning a blighted building around to a yeah. use, usable mean, building mm -hmm. with you know one or two new businesses in there that that's fabulous mm -hmm. that's what we want to see those are the types of projects that we'd like to see if you um have a bigger project and you're pursuing multiple funding avenues and you have received some sba you know money could that count as the 50 percent of the total project or yes okay yes it can that's a good question yeah um one of the other things oh man we were just talking and i was like oh i gotta ask this hmm. Uh, <laughs> you were about GCF? Yeah, and then I got distracted. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> oh, oh, okay. I, I remember now. Um, so, you know, up to this point, we've talked about individual businesses applying for DRLF, but can the development authority themselves apply for yes. this funding and yes. like proceed with, you know, getting property and renovating property and then turning it around? Yes. Okay. Yes. And oftentimes when that's the case, the, the DDA already has a project in mind, yeah. uh, meaning a business to move into that building mm -hmm. in mind. Um, they're going to be able to repay their debt service through the, the lease. Um, or it is a building that appears to be so far gone you know, one of those, nobody else is gonna one take of those it on. giant white elephants or just, uh, yeah, nobody else is going to take it on. And the DDA says, we got to do this. We've got to do this building. So that, that has been yeah. the case before, too. So that's good to know that it doesn't necessarily have to just be you waiting on businesses to take advantage of it, that a, an aggressive development authority who has the support of the city could apply for this funding right. and, you know, and work it like a competitive project like anybody else would. Right. I'm thinking I'm thinking of a building that you know maybe um in down in the in the first floor mm -hmm. the DDA that might be their office on one side yeah. in one bay and a new business on the other side and then apartments above. Exactly. And I think it's one of those things too again we're talking about making projects competitive, you know, utilizing all aspects of that building, not just the downstairs but upper story either for office space or residential if there is upper story. Mm -hmm. Again, making sure that you want to provide, you know, diversified income revenue streams um, as much as possible because why would we, you know, want just one downstairs area to have to float the whole building when right. it doesn't have to, you know. Now, granted there's there's more headaches and construction and everything that comes with that. Um, but again, to get the whole building contributing to paying that debt back versus mm -hmm. just one component of it right. is really important. Um, let me see if we have any questions. Is that what's going on over there? Yeah, I know. we got some really good questions <laughs> going on over here. Um, okay, so first one is, can a nonprofit apply? Um, if a nonprofit is acquiring a historically significant church to ultimately redevelop it into office space and a business incubator space for other nonprofits and for-profit businesses, would a nonprofit be able to apply? Yes, I think so. But again, the, the application has to come from, from the, the DDA, DDA or the city. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But again, it would be, you would be looking at it through the lens of does this project make sense? Is it going to cash flow? Right. Like, are we going to be able to pay our debt back and right. all that sort of stuff? But right. yeah, I mean, that, that makes sense. Yeah. Was, yeah. Good question. Um, let me see. Um, Casey, I can, re I can reach out to you with your, your reps for that area, but I will say too, um, for those of you who have new manager handbooks, um, we have in there a map 
of the DCA regions as well as the DCA reps contact information. Um, and we can um, include a link when we send out a copy of this webinar for anybody who's curious. If, the, if you don't know your rep and you want to get to know your rep, um, that, that's a great first step. Definitely and, get yeah. to know your rep. <laughs> get, they should be your new BFF. They need to be in your phone under your favorites and VIPs. And every time that person calls, you want to answer and you just want to bug the crap out of them anytime you think you have a good potential. Project. I would. I would note them for everything. <laughs> um, let me see. Yes, um, we can. We can definitely. What we're going to do with this presentation is we will upload it to our YouTube channel. Um, so anytime you want to share this with somebody, um, that it'll be there. To, to view and we'll also send it out as part of our newsletter next week with a PDF copy of it and links to supporting documentation and materials. And one of the other things I want to show you too is um, we're going to cut out of here and go to DCA's website. Um, so if, if you just Google DDRLF and then a space and then DCA, so our Downtown Development Revolving Loan Fund and then or Georgia, um, you know, it will take you to this page on our website, which I will say is a little bit easier than having to navigate DCA's website. I mean, Sheree and I didn't build it, so we can we can bash it a little bit. <laughs> but this is where you're going to find out basic information, talks about the terms and stuff like that. Sheree's contact information is here. Um, we've even got the consider applying contact to community service rep in your area. Boom, we've got applications here, fact sheets. So all this is on DCA's website to help you, um, to help walk you through that process. Ooh, we've got pictures. Um, it looks like our, one of our old what webinars that we, <laughs> yeah. that we have done before. So um, again, talks about the terms, um, the and funds, how it can be used, that sort of thing. And I was gonna say, I don't know that we mentioned this, but it does say clearly the maximum loan is 250,000 per project. Um, this past year, we did set a minimum, so we do not give out loans less than 50000 Okay. And then um, what's the terms on it? Like how many years do you typically have to pay it back? So it's 15 years. It's amortized for 15 years, and you have 15 years to pay it back. Okay. Cool. Because I know that there used to be some difference back in the day. It was like 10 years amortized over 15, and then you would have like a blue payment, payment at, at 10, the end, yeah, which like nobody wants, nobody and you're going to end up refinancing anyways. Exactly. exactly. <laughs> so that makes a little more sense. We just changed okay. it. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Let me see if we've got any more questions. Oh, good one. A typical time frame from start to finish. If someone's interested in a project, applying for it, um, obviously the construction and like completion is going to be on their end. But right. um, you know that that depends right. how long you take to to complete the project. But <laughs> right. from um, potentially finding out, like you know, could we do this to yes, you can do it. So the application process, if that's what you're yeah. asking about. So you would submit um, the IPA. And again, this is all um, this is all dependent upon whether or not you submit everything that we ask for, because if we have to go back and ask for additional information, that just adds time. But let's say you submitted an app, the IPA, the pre-application, the IPA, and you submitted everything we needed. We usually turn that around within two weeks and let you know whether or not um, to submit a full application. And then um, we ask that you submit a full application within, I think it's three months um, of getting that uh, invitation letter to submit a full application. And again, if we get everything in the first time with your full application, which I don't think we've ever gotten everything in the first time, <laughs> just saying, um, we usually have to go back and send a completeness letter and say, we're still missing a few other pieces. Um, I would say once we get a full application, about three months turnaround. Um, because it does have an extensive review process and, the, and you the, still got to go through the underwriting the underwriting has that. to be done yeah and then of course our commissioner signs off on it so sometimes it's dependent upon his schedule um so i would say about three months okay yeah i mean basically you know you want to start this early on you know yes. before yes, you yes, yes. you know committed to step 100 percent and like or you know 
you know, start pull down tiles and everything like that. You want to make sure if this, if your project is contingent on this, you want to make sure it's approved before you just start doing right. stuff with it. Um, now, do you have to own the property in order to apply? So if you were, if you didn't own the property, but your business was going in and you needed to fix stuff up or like, you know, white box to get it ready for you to move in, but you don't necessarily, you're not buying the property. You're just using it for the renovation of the property. Is that, is that doable? Right. We have done leasehold improvement projects before. Okay. Right. But we, we would need, of course, permission from the owner yeah. and that kind of thing. Yeah. Okay. But as long as you have an agreement with the owner to do that, then we can do it. Cool. And again, they're looking at projects that are going to be larger than $50,000 right. being awarded. Right. Again, you know, when you're working with limited funds, you want to make sure that they go to the highest, best use. Mm -hmm. And um, again, you know, kind of make sure that it's it's the most credit worthy project as well that, you know, it's, it's that debt's getting repaid. And so we can then do more of these fun kind right. of things. Right. <laughs> Um, I yeah. do think it's key though, when you're talking to folks, um, we would at least want them to have a business plan of some sort. Oh my sort. gosh. Yes. Um, I'm surprised at, at, at so many um, applications that we get that don't have a business plan. So we do go back and ask for something. Mm -hmm. We want to see at least three year projections mm -hmm. on what this business is going to, to what revenue that it can generate. We want to see that they're going to be able to meet that service. Yeah. So um, we will need those kind of things. I believe um, in the application if you want to click on that um dun, dun, dun. <laughs> it should have a list um within the applications yeah you can click there um of some of the things that we're going to be looking for that just give you an idea um and again when you're meeting with the regional rep in the business uh the regional rep can go over all aspects mm -hmm. of the application so that everybody's on the same page yeah and again before when i was showing you those side-by-side -side comparisons when we were talking about noi that net operating income that's where those those dollars and cents are going to come in when you have projections as far as potentially how much revenue you can be generating on that property that is really going to help you determine whether the project's going to cash flow or not um, because you're going to be able to see you know, okay, if I get traditional bank financing at this amount and I'm only bringing in this much money, am I going to be able to cover my debt on it? Um, and if and if you can't say yes, then, then that project probably needs to be revamped or revisited or maybe postponed or, right. or paused indefinitely. Um, but like those numbers are really important to know. And I will say like, I'm going to give a shout out to um, our small business development centers across the state. SBDC is a great resource for um, business plans to help you figure out, you know, what are my next steps going to be? Like you were saying, how integral that is to that whole process. Um, you know, they can be a great resource for that. And they, they do have offices all over the state. Um, you know, and again, you know, that's just another partner in this whole, in this whole process that can, that can help out. Let me see. Any last questions? Um, I'm looking at your question. <laughs> um, so one of them, one of the questions says, can the DDA make requirements on their own before deciding to partner with the business for a loan? If so, how does the DDA create a boundary or requirement? I guess, so I'm guessing what you're saying is, do you want to define like the areas that you would offer it to um, before you allow someone to apply? Is that what you're asking? Yeah, give us more Harvest. detail. Yeah, we might need a little bit more clarification as far as um, what what your what your question is. What I'm thinking he's saying is, you know, like that the Main Street program themselves would define the area realistically as far as like, okay, this these are. The, you know, this is the district that we think would be businesses within it would be most eligible. Or, or I was also thinking um, this area is the Main Street's top priority. This mm -hmm. block right this now. This is where we're going to concentrate. Let's say because the city is building a park right there. Mm -hmm. So this is their top priority area. They would prefer uh, any of their DDRLFs to come from that to area. To happen in that area. Um, yeah. I suppose. <laughs> I'm not sure. Um, I mean, if they were challenged, I'm not sure it would hold up. Yeah, I was but. gonna say. <laughs> <laughs>
I, yeah, I mean, I, I think it's one of those things, like, I never think it's bad to say this is an area we're focusing on investing in. Um, it doesn't, it, you know, again, it's one of those things that it could still come to the state level, and we could determine it to not be part of your, you know, or downtown. Yeah. Right. So I mean, there, there's always that chance, um, you know, but I think, you know, anytime that you're saying, hey, we're trying to focus and concentrate on this area, that's never a bad thing, especially right. if you're saying there's incentives there to support it. And if you're a rural zone community, I think even more so um, to, you know, to try and layer those incentives um, to say, this is our rural zone district, or, you know, really aggressively supporting, you know, uh, projects within this to take advantage mm -hmm. of the DDRLF, we'd love to, you know, put in an application on your behalf, um, okay. because you know, you're going to be creating jobs, you know, that you're going to be able um, you're going to be taking tax credits on the acquisition and the renovation of the property. So, right. So right now we have one project um, in our rural zone that was approved for a DDRLF and um, they were able to take advantage of all three tax credits within the That's rural zone amazing. program. That's amazing. So for a total, I want to say of around $61,000 in tax credits over five years. Wow. And then plus they, they received our DDRLF. So That's huge. Great project in downtown Bainbridge. Thanks, yeah. Amanda. Yeah. Love it. <laughs> Love it when it all works out and comes together. Yeah. <laughs> well, thank you guys. It looks like we've come to the natural conclusion of today's webinar. We appreciate having you. We appreciate you being here. Um, and come back next time to check us out. We'll see you guys. Bye.